Welcome, author of Locks. I am reading this at the moment. Um, we just spoke before about how I've come across you. Um, as t T-shirt I'm wearing, as this podcast viewers and, and listeners who've been with the podcast in this first year, my, um, my expression through this podcast is a lot to do with my trajectory and my childhood and okay. growing up it, kind of a little bit lost entering the chaos, trying to mm. find myself mm. and then getting a bit older, educating myself a bit, learning about mm. psychology, learning about the human experience, mm. recognising pattern, seeing that what happens in your childhood has a big, big part to play in the trajectory we may or may not take. So this podcast is kind of infused by just the wonder of being a human and how we all fucking get through this crazy, crazy <laughs> journey. And a friend of mine put me on to you uh, recently and I've been reading the book, and as I just said, I've, I kind of, I like to learn as much as I can about people that come into my into my sort of front line. Mm -hmm. But I've kind of tried to keep a reasonable distance until I get this book read. But here you are with us, and I'm I'm so I'm so uh, grateful, and it's, um, I'm I'm really interested to get into this. So, <clears throat> you've written this book, Locks. We're not going to start here. I want to start. I want to okay. start. What was it like for you growing up? You okay. were you were a lad from the outskirts of Liverpool, but I mm -hmm. think you were born in you're a Yorkshireman. I'm a Yorkshireman and Deal's born in Beverly by oh, yeah. Hull. There yeah, you go. Yeah. And um, you're mixed race. Your dad's from yes. Jamaica. Yes. Take us back to the start. We're going to arrive at this book. This book has got an amazing uh, story that I'm halfway through. And like I say, I, I'm, I don't want to spoil it, but I might I might get a few spoilers today. <laughs> how have you arrived at today? Where, what, how did this all start? Okay. Well, um, you know, I guess like... You, you spoke yourself. I don't know about your own background, Sam, but I think... How old are you? I'll be 40 on Monday. Yeah, so you're getting on to nearly as old as me. Yeah, you're which I want to point out right now as well for listeners. Really, we're going to point people to this book, especially people of my generation, your generation, because I love the detail that you put in about the time. Yeah. The top I got from Stolen from Ivor. I was like, yeah. fucking <laughs> Stolen <laughs> from Ivor. <either." laughs> yeah. You know, and you really make a point of like furnishing the environment and the feeling and the time you know um mm. you do a wonderful job of that sorry I oh interject. bless you no no thank you and thanks for having us by the way i didn't no, get to say that before. i really pleasure. appreciate it so yeah the book is set in 1993 which is when i turned 17 but i gather from what you're asking me you'd like me to start before yeah, then yeah. and build up to that yeah. so yeah i was raised in a, a little village on the outskirts of liverpool i call it sea bank in the book Mm -hmm. I, I fictionalised the names of people and yeah. some of the places just to, you know, to save embarrassment for people and that kind of thing. Um, but it's genuine, it's, it's mainly a true story. Mm. The main narrative arc, all, all the stuff in that, that happened in Jamaica, that all happened. Okay. Building up to that, I guess, I didn't feel like I ever fit in in the place. I've never felt like I've ever fitted in anywhere that I've lived. And that's not an issue anymore. I'm quite happy to not fit in and to be feel like a universal human being actually mm. is a great benefit. Yeah. And to not fit into the world of <clears throat> this kind of a binary idea of race that we have as well, and to not fit into either side of that, not only because my mum is white and my dad's black, but also because of my upbringing, because nobody was black. Well, there was, there was two other black lads my age and a Persian guy and a couple of Chinese girls. And I, you know, there's, you know, but there was very, very few non-white people in our village so i wasn't brought up with that black culture either and it wasn't really something we discussed a lot of people who emigrated from other countries in the 60s 50s and 60s like my dad didn't really talk about where they were from they wanted to just get on with being in england make the most of it overcome the racism they faced on a daily basis people used to talk about my mum my mum and dad were both in the NHS and the rumours were that my mother, she was a beautiful Scottish woman so and she's with a black man, therefore she was horribly burnt from the neck down was one of them from a fire. That was one of the rumours, not true. That's why she's with a black man. Another one was that she's an ex-prostitute. That's why she's with a black man. You understand? Mm. But rather than discussing that stuff, the way that people like my dad dealt with it, which I respect now, I was angry about it one time, but I really respect now, is just by ignoring it and just cracking on 
and making the most of the social mobility that was available for some people in the 80s, particularly if you work in the public sector. So my mum and dad worked their way up to the NHS, started with nothing and ended up at the top. My mum was a matron. My dad was eventually principal lecturer of nursing at John Moores University. Wow. So the house got bigger. Well, they've got an extension, another one, another one, and mm-hmm. then bought a big house, you know. Yeah. I say big, you know, four bedrooms, yeah. ensuite bathroom, yeah. double garage, Ford Granada. It's all in the box. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so we didn't talk about black history, Jamaican history, African history. So the books on my shelf in my parents' house were the same as everybody else's bookshelf. The films that we watched growing up were the same John Wayne nonsense movies with John Wayne running mm. around shooting I- Indians as if they're the baddies yep. <laughs> encroaching on somebody else's land, yep. you know. And I aspire to be like the people that we see in the movies, the same people who are kicking down maybe black people's doors in the cop show, but never are the black person who is the cop. The cop, the black person was never the hero. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. So that kind of the racist, the white supremacist system in which we were raised, and this is something I'm really passionate about talking about with people, was ingrained in us as black and brown people as well. We were not immune to it. Indeed, how old were we before we even learned to think critically, to consider what the media and what the environment is doing to us and think about why we think the way we think and then question our worldview, the map inside our heads. Mm. By the time we get to even thinking like that, we're probably teenagers or young adults. If we're lucky enough yeah, to ever to arrive start there. Th- to yeah. ever arrive there. Mm-hmm. I work with people in prisons who are 40 odd, 50 odd before they suddenly go, hang on a minute. Yeah. No one's ever asked me why I think the way I think. Yeah. You know? So we are not immune to the white supremacist system ourselves as black and brown people. It's in us as well. Mm-hmm. So then there comes a kind of a confusion for me it was this thing of it was the police harassment that really pushed me getting arrested it's all in the book three times 14 15 16 for nothing handcuffed in front of members of my community put in the police car taken to the cells banged up shoes belt taken off you all that stuff for no good reason then taken to court the first i was taken to court and they tried to get me to plead guilty to stealing a bike yeah even though your friend's bike that you were just yeah 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 indeed and, you know, um, everybody knew the kid who had robbed the bike. A well-known thief. I was not a thief. I was from a good family. We weren't poor. I, I was spoiled. I got loads of pocket money. <laughs> I didn't need to rob things. <laughs> mm. Mm. But, so it was that that really got me, that really pushed me to the, to the brink. It made me angry enough to go, I'm going to make something extreme happen in order to understand what this identity that is foisted upon me. So it starts with when you're a little kid, you're coloured. That was the polite term back in the 80s, you're coloured. My my mum says you're half cast, your dad's black. And again, as I mentioned in the book, I, I, this is absolutely true. I remember five years old about that then, looking in the mirror standing on top of the bin and looking in the mirror in the bathroom and trying to, I don't have stripes of purple, red, orange, yellow across my face. So why do they keep saying I'm coloured? Mm. I haven't got these, but neither's my dad. We haven't got these colours. I don't know what they mean. And I could not see that my dad, as a six foot two black Jamaican guy with a massive afro and a massive afro beard at the time, <laughs> I could not see that he looked different yeah. to anybody else's dad. I guess because as, as a child, you're not thinking, well, that's the, the point that thing out that tone of skin and that curly hair that that's a thing that people would bother to notice. It, mm. It's not a thing. Mm. So you don't think about it. So, but you get, you get angsty as a teenager, you've got the hormones going, it's difficult enough developing, deciding who you are for all of us. That's why I've called the character based on me in the book Eon, because I want Eon to represent our Eon our era. That's why I wanted to ask you that. I wanted to get to that. How did you arrive at that name? Not just black people or mixed race people, but people like yourself, all of us, because we've all, at this moment, we're coming, we've been on this 500 year journey of the development of the European empires, pushing into the Americas and Africa and further east. Mm. And now we're coming to a kind of, the end of that process, the European empires are in decline, the American empire is in decline. And we're the people at the back end of this thing. And we don't, British people talk about being ashamed of being British because of the empire. 
There's a confusion for mm -hmm. all of us. Who are we? What's our place in the world? But that's not a negative thing. Again, that's a really positive thing. Yeah. It's that like it's that, uh, uh, like a culture in adolescence. Okay, I like that. That's lovely. You know, uh, so we're going through the growing pains. Yeah. So Eon, a hope for Eon to represent our era. You as well as any black or mixed race person, Sam. You know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what sent me. That's what drove me to go to Jamaica in search of a belonging. Of course, at that point, what I thought I would find in Jamaica was a place I fit in, belong, find people who are like me and therefore just connect with me, just look at me and go, yeah, you're one of us, welcome home. On the contrary. It didn't quite work that way. <laughs> so so what I want to get at as well, Ashley, is, is you mentioned mum and dad, dad's black, mum's white. Yeah. You're, you're, you're doing well. You're not an inner city kid on impoverished you're on the outskirts no. of the suburbs you live well yeah, man. so this wonders in you this wonders in you you're hearing all of these things said you know colored half cast all these things what was the actual environment in the home what were mum and dad mm. like together loving mm. loving you mm. were you were they behind you are they um, creative you know mm. what sparked the wonder was it you know and what was mm. it like at home and when you did get to that age of 16 and you were like right i'm off mm. Were you in a good energy with your folks? Were you mm. escaping your folks as much as this wider environment? What was it like being mm. a kid and, and, and prior to becoming 16 mm. and, and saying, right, I'm going to go and find out who I am? Mm. I love my mum and dad, the good people. Um, I get on really, really well with them now. Uh, at that time, around about then, they, they split up, they're back together. They've been together, for, again, for decades now. They've you know, remarried. Um, I think it was around about then. It was, it was just after I came back from Jamaica, actually, they, they ended up getting divorced. Um, but yeah, everybody questions their upbringing at that point, and they question the parents. Now, I'm again, this is not a black thing. It's, it's nothing to do with race. This is to do with the British culture. I'm sure most people, I'm sure you would probably agree with me, that yeah. if not you, then most of your friends did not talk to your parents in the way that our kids talk to us. We didn't have conversations about how do you feel no. about what's going on in the news, politics, culture, society. We just didn't, it just mm. wasn't there. Mm. And I, I got to a point where I really resented that, particularly on the, you know, on the racial... Uh, the history you know, of the history well, of just, you. Just the fact that it wasn't a conversation. Yeah. And that I was angry that people, that I thought teachers judged me. I had the police judging me. I had all kinds of experiences where people were calling me things in the streets and that kind of thing. It was always the thing if someone gets angry with you or wants to put you down, then the, the, the N word, black bastard, the coon, all of the, it's all in the book. <laughs> That's what comes out. And, and I felt the anger towards that. But then I felt, who do I talk to about this? I don't know any other black people. I mean, but I've got an eight, a brother who's eight years older than me, but he was away in the army. Well, he just left the army. Anyway, that's another thing. I've got a sister who's eight years older than me, but she wasn't really interested in talking about race and that kind of thing. So I had a nice upbringing. I was spoiled. I had a very nice upbringing. Um, I was treated well. I had nice friends. I was a really happy-go-lucky kid. Uh, but there come a point whereby I just... I'd been... If you reach the point in here where I get battered in school and the guy's shouting black bastard while he kicks me on the ground, okay... Experiences like that where I hadn't really fought back, I hadn't used my physical strength in order to protect myself, that all of a sudden came a point whereby I just thought, I'm letting people get away. I don't have to let people get away with treating me this way. The reason why I didn't often fight people with you know, physically is because I just didn't see the point of violence. Yeah. I, didn't, I wasn't interested in who was cock of the school. That wasn't me. Right. Um, but the anger, the angst came in and there was nobody to kind of talk to about it. And my friends, I talked to my friends about being black. They wouldn't understand what I'm talking about. And I tried to talk about, I'd say nonsense things because I didn't know my history. So I'd say things like, well, we're only here because white people brought us here. Yes. As if, as if, as if, I thought all black people come to the country because they were slaves. <laughs> slaves have been brought to Britain or something, which clearly isn't the history of black Britain. <laughs> but I didn't know. Mm. And, and they just look at me like, what, what are you talking about? What, 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 you know, we... We don't even think you are any different. Well, you don't think I'm any different, but you've seen me get arrested three times. You've seen me get pulled up and searched while you're not getting searched. Mm. You've heard me call black blast. You've seen me, you've seen people shout nigger at me. You've seen me have been, be battered. But I know you, I know you're not racist, but 
can you understand there's a mm-hmm. thing here? Mm-hmm. Anyway, so there was anger and obviously a resentment of the family. That's not my parents' fault. As I say, so many immigrants, so many people of our age will tell you the same story. You couldn't talk to adults about those kind of things mm. in, in those days. And so many uh, children of immigrants will tell you the same story. The parents just try to do the best to make it here and to make it work. And they didn't understand why we were so angry. It's like, well, don't you realise you live in a great country and you've got a great opportunity and where I come from is like a third world country and I, I grew up with no shoes and nothing. I, I thought that if, that if I got a goat, if my dad gives me a goat one day, I'll be rich. And you've got all these things. You've got this, all these great clothes and TVs and CD players and records and all, posters all over this fancy, massive bedroom, a double bed. What, what have you got to complain about? Mm. But you don't realise that what we felt was, I, I don't feel lucky to be here. Interesting. I'm from here. Yeah. So yeah. why should I be treated differently to the kid next door? I didn't come here to make something happen. This is my home. This is where I'm from. I'm English. <laughs> mm, interesting, yeah. Such a <clears throat> such a paradox for the, for the, that that second generation, isn't it? Mm. The generation, as you say, you you are here, but you've got this. Your your folks are trying to, and you know, beautifully as well, just chin up and work hard and earn a place in the face of, you know, the societal prejudice and so on. But then this younger generation, they don't know, they haven't got that in their, in their psyche, that, mm-hmm. that history, that experience. You've got mm-hmm. to learn that as you go through and you're learning it via all of this incoming confusion. Yes. It's got to be difficult. With no one talking about it. This kind of stuff was not discussed in the media mm-hmm. by 1993 when I got went to Jamaica. This wasn't the kind of thing you heard in the media. It wasn't on the news. People, uh, well, it just, it just wasn't there. There was no black role models on telly. When Trevor McDonald first presented the news at 10, when I was a kid, I was too young to remember, but my brother and sister got shouted down from the bedroom because it was so exciting. Me dad must have thought it was going to be a one-off, but it was so exciting. There's a black man presenting the news. Pivotal. Whoa, whoa hang on. If you want to run down and look at the telly, it's a black guy presenting the news. You know, mm. but where were the other black guys on telly? Mm-hmm. There was not, we're, we're, we're excited now in what the 2020s, we're excited that we get a black Marvel superhero or, yeah. you yeah. know, in Black Panther or or, yeah. or, or, or we get like a, 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 a black um, Spider-Man. Mm. Mm. Oh, it's, it's a massive thing to us. Oh, wow. Mm. And that's now. Mm. So there was no way of expressing it. And, you know, the thing that did, the thing that did it for me, which for, like for so many of us still to this day, young men in particular, I think, was rap. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. You know, oh, there's, there's someone saying what I think, what I feel. Huge. And yet it was American and I didn't understand half of the stuff they were taught. I didn't know who Louis Farrakhan was or where Compton was or yeah. who half the people they're referring to are. But still, you, you're expressing that The identity resentment. of your experience. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that resentment against the society that is, a, that is oppressing you for no good reason. Nobody else is saying it, but you are. Tupac, NWA, Dallas, or whatever. You're, you're, you're saying it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So that was huge for me. Um, mm. And obviously people like Bob Marley. Yeah. You know, reggae artists and the whole Rastafarian movement. Oh, out there saying it. Mm. So yeah, Jamaica seemed to be the place. Uh, excuse me, dad's from there, you know. Um, and had you been previously? Holidays, anything like that, see family? Yeah, so in, in the book, I write this, as I say, the book is partly fictionalised, so there was no point going into that in the book it makes it kind of more yeah. interesting if it's Eon's first trip to Jamaica in reality I had been to Jamaica once before actually the year before okay so the culture shock that you'll have read in, in this from the that year actually before. happened the year before yeah 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 cool and okay so let's get to let's get to locks and let's just show people at home what locks looks like can you see that Aiden? yeah I'll pull it up yeah are you going to pull it up on the screen that's amazing you know 
like I say, I've, I'm, I just love the word. I, I mean, I'm not articulate enough to describe the feeling I'm getting from your writing. And as I'm learning more about you in the last couple of weeks, and uh, as I will, and we will today, mm. I feel like your ability to write is something intrinsic. That's in you. You know, you're, mm. the, like I said, we joke about stolen from either, but these little simple details and the way you skirt from the moment back into a historical sort of pivot point that relates back mm. and really smooth, really honest, like, vividly honest it feels like and I can't say that for you and your story but for the mm -hmm. life and the understanding of growing up in a bunch of lads watching a porno in 1995 yep. while someone's mum's out you know and knowing that that arc that narrative that's happening everywhere and all those ripple effects of the individuals who's you know Billy who's come from the family where his mum and dad are cool and they're, yeah, they're not bothered he's watched a porno whereas oh fucking if someone finds out oh, oh my you know and all of that comes through just so real mm -hmm fascinating amazing I'm, I'm not i'm not even quite halfway through um you go to jamaica at 16 mm. to find your identity to find about your history to find mm. out about what you just talked about there what the fuck's going on how mm. am i here and this is happening i want to belong i want to know who i am mm. you go to jamaica mm. what happens mm. <laughs> um I don't want to give too much of I guess I'm not looking at where you're at with your bookmarkers. But, um, well, basically, the way I always describe it is a, 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 a concise terms is that, you know, like I got, within a couple of days, I'd ended up mugged. You hit the ground running, that's for sure. Hit the yeah. ground running, yeah, yeah. I was off my head. I was naive. Um, I was very, 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 very drunk and high. And um, I staggered down the street and looking vulnerable in a third world country where some people didn't own shoes. Mm. People don't realise how poor Jamaica is, you know. Mm. Do you think it's cool because they've heard of it and they know about Bob Marley and his things, maybe a bit like America. It's well, parts of America are third world, mm. the way people live. But anyway, um, I was very naive. I, I, got, I, got, I got mugged and stabbed. I don't blame anyone but myself for these experiences. By the way, I made the, the first line of the book. I had to something had to happen, and I keep yeah. saying I had to make something happen. Yeah. I made this happen, so you, we can come back to that if you want. That yeah, might yeah. sound a bit mystical, but um, yeah, I got mugged and stuff, and then I got arrested a couple of days later. And one thing led to another, as you'll discover. It was a minor, the, the most minor crime imaginable, but for that minor crime, I ended up being locked up for a few days, then going to court. And they in court realised, oh, my God, they're going to try and keep me banged up for, like, let's say it must have been, like, six weeks at that point. For, for nothing. For, for having a few spliffs in a ciggy box. And I'd already... I'd, in Jamaica. Yeah. And in Jamaica! I know! It was illegal at the time. It's illegal. It's legal now in Jamaica. But, yeah, I know. It grows in the cracks in the pavement. It's pretty ubiquitous. You know what even, I mean? Mm -hmm. Um... And I'd already had someone, you know, try and stab me with a sharp implement and people tried to take me boots off me and this one. But I was like, okay, it's over now. It's over. But in court, I just realised this is just, this is just descending into some other situation now. They're going to put me back in the police. They're going to take me back to that place that I've just got out of. And indeed, they took me to another place called Cops in Hanover. Place of, Cops, place of safety for boys. It said on the sign, place of safety for boys. Oh. I think, sure in. I think the line. I think, I think the line they're using there is a, uh, and justice chuckles uh, at own evil irony. You know, <laughs> place of safety. Yeah. By God, it was the least safe place you've ever seen. You can Google it. The Jamaican Gleaner even it's did articles. Up, it's, it's, it's closed down now, but the Jamaican Gleaner even did articles. Even the Jamaicans thought it was rough. You know what I mean? Yeah. The Jamaicans like. Boo! What's going on here? Um, and but what they don't talk about in the Jamaican cleaner is that in cops they had a place called the Strong Room, which was an underground dungeon where they put you if you've been caught trying to escape or fighting or something like that. And if you're me, <laughs> um, maybe it was the resentment of foreign people or this kind of what should he search for? Ashley, to bring that up. To bring what? To bring up uh, uh, cops, C O P S E. Uh, Jamaican Gleaner is the newspaper. Gleaner. 
if it's still up there, that was a couple of years ago that I looked at that particular article. C-O-P-S-E, uh, Hanover. Um, as I say, this is... The, and they put you straight straight in So there. they put me in this place called the... Yeah, yeah, straight into the strong room. Again, which I did, had no idea where it was, what this was. It's, it's in the middle of the mountains, this place, you know. Um, and there's, you know, about... There's about, there's about 14 other lads in there when they put me and these two young lads in there. Now, you don't... Once the, once the gate shuts behind you, you don't leave 24 hours a day. You go down underground. There's one light bulb in there. The toilets don't flush. And the taps don't run. And this is a tropical country. You can imagine how that smells. And there's lads, there was you know, one lad told me he'd been in there for I think it was two months that he said. Two months without a change of clothes, without a decent meal, without a wash, without a flushing toilet, with all these other lads. There was a group of about seven lads that were all older lads from Kingston, probably about 17, 18, 19 years old. No one, they wouldn't tell anyone what they were in there for. They were all smartly dressed. So everyone thought they were probably G. They were probably in there for something serious, but they wouldn't talk about it. A few other lads that were about my age who thought they were like the top guys in there you know they're the ones who really went to work on me you know uh, one young one big guy massive guy who was just the one that they tried to pretended to batter well physically did batter on a daily basis as one of the ways of trying to escape <laughs> the way they kill time every day was by trying to escape and one of the things they do is batter this guy till he screams and when the guards come they try and rush the guards and get out you know um, and then there was like three younger lads, I'd say maybe they were 13, 14 kind of age. And uh, yeah, in the, yeah, I was only in there for a couple of days before I got out of the strong room and then was just in the, in the, in the living in the, in the dormitory in Cops, which is where again all kinds of crazy things happened, but I don't want to spoil mm. it. Well, no, listen, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, you know. Well, the, 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 you know, the, yeah, there was, a, there was a beautiful guy who became my guardian angel and he was the toughest lad in there and he looked after me and I watched him drown. Wow, I mean, I've, I've seen um, you talk about this. Yeah, you know? yeah. How did that come about, Ashley? So what's the story there? How's that coming <sighs> around? You could just walk out of cops. It was in the middle of nowhere. The You know, the guards were just like miserable old geezers in ripped jeans and Hawaii shirts, yeah, just hitting with big sticks that they'd hit the kids with. You know, there was no real discipline or rules there. There's a few stuff. And people just wandered out because there's nowhere you could run to. It was in the middle of nowhere. The guards used to wander out and go up to the top of the hill and buy some weed off the raster and, you know, have a smoke up in the tree and whatever. And one day we wandered out, wandered out there and went down to the river. And the guys were jumping in the river and washing with soap and having a play. And these two guys, um, in the book I call them uh, Red Douglas and uh, Shepherd. that wasn't the actual names. They were racing, they were swimming, uh, having a race, but I wouldn't get in because they had these massive stab wounds, these wounds that were now open in my leg and in my back. So in the foreign country, didn't want to get mm. infected or whatever, so I was just watching but I'm a good swimmer. I was thinking, I'd, I'd, I'd smash them if I was racing them. <laughs> I'd smash them, man. Oh, I was tempted, but I just watched them. And then they just glided. <sighs> Under the water. No splashing. Just like, 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 like they just both decided to dive under the water on purpose. <sighs> and I'm sat there watching. And they never returned. And that was it. They were, and they found the bodies a couple of days later downstream. So what's the phenomenon there then? What's what's some spinning undercurrent, eddy in the water, you know? And there was a couple of old guys sat on, on, on like the uh, the veranda of a an old wooden house, watched us go down there. And when we were the lads were walking up and down, shouting the guys' names and get starting to get panicky. And these old geezers were like, "You lose your friends." Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, oh, them dead man. Enough man drowning in that river, you know. It's have a spinning undercurrent. Simple as that. Fuck. And, th and then we wandered back to back up to cops. And and and, 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 and you're the, sixteen here, aren't you? This was just after my seventeenth birthday, 17th which birthday. I had in cops, which so, was the same day as my beautiful friend who drowned. We both had our seventeenth birthday, and then that happened. So the trauma you're spinning through at this moment is untold. And we wandered back up to cops and they said to us, well, you see what happened when you break the rules. 
<laughs> I never saw any family come to talk about these boys. That are, I don't know what happened to the bodies, but I, I never personally saw any family or anything. So you just get taken back and crack on. We just crack that's on. That's it. That's it. That's all it says about it. You see what happens when you break the rules, doesn't it? And then you've got that in your mind every night for I don't know how long. The only photograph I still have of that period was when someone came to visit me in a taxi and took a shady picture from the taxi of me and my beautiful friend. And I've still got that picture. Mm. And it's in a frame in my front room. Mm. Mm. That was one of the things I was going to ask you if you had any pictures you might be able to email over to kind of... Well, and that... That one there, yeah. that's the only other one uh, from the holiday. Uh, <laughs> holiday, I say. <laughs> Experience. That is on the balcony of uh, the hotel. Um, and that is me actually showing someone uh, the, the slash wound that was in my back. You can't see it on the picture. Right. But the reason why I use the picture, for those who know the history, there's a very famous picture of a slave showing... Um, the scars all over the back from whippings mm. and he's in that exact pose right and it really yeah. going back through me things and looking I was like wow that, that's symbolic symbolic yeah. mm. so we thought well we'll use that for the back of the book you know? mm. amazing amazing and uh, and we'll get to that you know the, the way that the book's got these lovely illustrated chapter starters and also when we get oh, to rise yeah. up you know oh, wow. ask us about that beautiful people that have designed all that amazing yeah mm. really like I said, so thorough and and um, and rounded and and I mean, I'm still getting my head around that that there. You know, you've obviously got your way of dealing with mm. whatever it is you're dealing with, but mm. it's one thing seeing something like that happen, mm. and I don't know the procedures that we would imagine that would happen, some kind of emergency. Patching something back up, people, things, mm. talking through something, but mm. you're just taken back in. You're already in this crazy world of discovery and fear and mm. all of it. And then that just happens, and then just on you go. That's breaking the rules. Jesus. Nothing else was ever said about Apart from, say, like two days later, the lads were taken downstream because some of them found the bodies, and they came back <coughs> telling me I couldn't go because... Um, a guy who worked for the American Embassy again sort of mm -hmm. happened to own our hotel and the American Embassy forced him to come and see me and it, that's why I eventually got out before the time I was supposed to get out right. um, on bail I then had to skip the country illegally because he was trying to yeah. keep me in the country I had to get out of the country now this guy had our flight tickets and passports and travellers checks in his safe in his hotel and he'd signed for my bail and wanted to keep us in the country for me to go back to court. So I had to find a way to get my passport and flight tickets and get the hell out of the country without being seen. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's but, yeah, an ordeal. He, mm, that's, that's an ordeal. Uh, yeah, indeed. So he, he, but he came to see me. He came to visit me on the day they were going to see the bodies. So some of the kids went down, looked at the body and came back to, telling me that they looked blue and bloated. Um, and... and, and and also people talked about them because people, you know, sometimes there's a certain magic between people and everyone was aware of that magic between, I'm going to keep calling him Shepherd just to be respectful. That wasn't his actual name. Um, between me and Shepherd, people people knew there was a spark as soon as they saw the two of us. Because I'm so weird because I'm this white kid in their in eyes. Jamaica, yeah. I'm this white kid. And Shepherd's this tall, beautiful guy that everyone seems to be think he's the toughest guy, but I never saw him hit anyone just or or bully anyone or even say anything aggressive to anyone. He just seemed to be a beautiful beautiful angel. But but he was the dude. Um and people saw this spark between us and then he died. And then there was this thing that well his duppy in Jamaica a duppy is a ghost. He said, well his duppy is with the white boy. So that was that's I think of that on a daily basis. Oh he he and duppy, he and duppy with the white boy, you know. Mm. And that's not a good thing. Right, it's not very, a good thing. No, um, yeah, they're very suspicious of uh, a lot of Jamaican people. You know, they're, they're quite suspicious of. That's why they talk about Duppy Conqueror and reggae music and that kind of thing. You know, there's right. a great yeah. suspicion of anything kind of mystical or spiritual. I, I guess it's probably tied in with the whole Christian belief system and that kind of thing. You know, mm. 
devil's work and that kind of thing. You know, mm. I'm not going to be sent to no Jamaican culture that well, but no, yeah. No. I know from, from what my dad tells me, another Jamaican people tell me there's certainly a, mm. yeah, I guess they, they see that as being linked to paganism or voodoo or darker magic. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> in the book, I mean, Increase, mm. a cousin figure. Mm. Now, again, we've got the real arc and we've got a fictional arc. Mm. As I was reading it and I was get, as I'm reading the story, I'm, I'm enveloped by the story, but I'm also really aware of your style. And, that, and part of me is thinking, this increase feels a bit like a mystical person. It almost feels like a subconscious version of you, almost like you in the future, <laughs> kind of, as you're narrating the story and writing, it's almost as if it's like, he's like a version of you in the future who's got this knowledge and this wide history and this this knowing mm. now he almost yeah i i, I mean I'm, I'm only where i'm at in the book and obviously you're at loggerheads a little bit and and there's an energy pull there mm. is that depicted on is that a section real is it you were there with your cousin i was there with my brother your brother your older mm. brother so increase mm. is depicting your older brother is that right to or in increase some, because, you know, I wanted to be careful not to write about other people. I don't yeah, mind, as you say, yeah. the book's really honest. Mm. And I don't mind being as honest as possible about me. Yes. But there's a duty, isn't there, I But guess. there's a duty, yes, it's to protect other people. They're not, they haven't been asked, they haven't asked to be in a book. So what I did with the increased character was I made an amalgamation of various people that I knew then. Various black men that I looked up to. Various black men who had, um, mm, they had the insidious white supremacist ideology um, was expressed through them in a certain way, a certain anger towards the black community itself. Mm. Mm. That comes across, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, and also, and it's just really, really, uh, it's just really interesting that you've picked up on the fact that uh, increase also is aspects of me of an older me a wiser more educated articulate mm, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah educated angry um <laughs> yeah kill yeah killamonger-esque somebody sent me a, a message on messenger the other day saying oh, i love ink this is killamonger-esque style <laughs> wow yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. so yeah it's, you know, there's, there's, there's bits, you know, say, bit, bits of various people okay. in there to make that okay. kind of Is that a difficult thing to try and do then, to amalgamate? Was it to try and be, when you find yourself being maybe a bit too close to a truth of mm -hmm. someone like a brother or mm -hmm. a mother or, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and do you have to bounce that off of them or do you make your own decision saying, oh, that's a bit too close, let's go this way? Mm -hmm. With this, I've, I've, I've made my own decisions and, and, and then hoped for the best and then... Um, lived in great uh, trepidation and fear mm. of, of, of how yes. not only my family and friends and the people of the place that I grew up, but also the black community, the, the white community mm. and the uh, people in general, because mm. nobody uh, gets away scot-free in this, didn't he? No, no, <laughs> Everyone but, gets... But that's life, man, as well, though, isn't it? Mm. And truth hurts, mm. you know, we mm. know that for sure. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, I found, I found, I found that uh, the increased character really quite intrigued me and the way that it sort mm. of comes in and out kind of mystically as well, in, even in the geography of the story, you know, like mm. he appears and then he disappears and he's kind of guiding you, but then he's pulling you and he's pushing you as well. And He, you love, he loves Eon, he hates Eon. Yeah. He, he loves himself and hates himself. Yeah. He loves his father and hates his father. Mm. He loves his community and hates his community. He loves Jamaica and hates Jamaica. Yeah. He loves women and hates women. Yeah. He's a misogynist mm. and a lover, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lover, man. He's yeah. a human being trying He's to work a this fucking shit out. <laughs> He's trying to deal with this binary nonsense. That's one, you know, if, if, if someone could tell me what's the most important thing that he's trying to express here, it's the overcoming of this binary way of seeing the world mm. black people white people male female mm. young and old mm. past future you know um gay and straight 
I deal with homophobia in, 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 in there as well. <sighs> Trying to overcome, which, is, which is, I think as well in, in this kind of growing pains of our adolescence as a culture, I feel that this is what's happening at the moment. I feel the whole transgender debate. Yeah. I feel BLM, Black Lives Matter, and this whole All Lives Matter. I, I feel that what happened on the Capitol mm. in the US, I feel, I feel this is all part of it. Mm. Part of us coming to the end of this You said it in the beginning. Process. You said the empire, the, 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 the falling of our established, what we thought we'd established is who we are, and actually we're realising it's not who we are, and it's, it is declining, and we are forming a new, along with technology and the way technology is integrated into the way we communicate, how we read ourselves, how we read each other, this thing is changing at pace, at speed, and it's scary. And when your worldview is challenged, a, a change is coming. Mm. And change could mean danger. Mm. And that puts people into fear. And that's part of what's happening at the moment, in my way of reading it. So what happens when people get like a fear response is they get a fight or flight response. Okay, so it, in terms of the race thing, and this happens with the talk about sexism and the talk about homophobia and transgender and all kinds of different, but just sticking with the race thing, what happens is I, if I try and talk to some white people about we, the fact we live in a white supremacist patriarchy yeah. and they don't like that because they're, they're a white man and they feel challenged by that, but their worldview is being challenged. Yeah. So the fight or flight very often seems to manifest as either flight, as in, well, I'm not a racist. Yes. Yeah. Not me. Not me. Well, well, I am, mate, so well done you. You, you managed to overcome what I couldn't. I'm the one with the brown face here, mate. Or that fight. Are you, are you saying... Yeah. Are you, are you, hmm? mm. are you accusing me? Mm. Hmm? Or that freeze. So many... <laughs> women, black people and gay people and so on will, tell, will be able to tell you. <laughs> Every black person watching this in Britain will be able to tell you that you get this thing, this experience, yeah. with you just go, yeah. I'll just wait for you to stop talking. Yeah. Yeah. And then say something unrelated to yeah. what you were trying to discuss with yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. It's just sensitively confused and sh unsure mm. and paranoid and... Mm. Yeah, the fear. Mm. The fear. The fear of change because you don't know what's coming with that change. You don't know what that change means, which is why the people in positions of power now and the, and the, the, the white supremacists and the, the, the racists and the, the patriarchy are clinging on. It's so, so hard. They, oh, they won't let go. It's tough because mm. things just move on. They haven't got any choice. Mm. But they don't know what that change will, because none of us do. What will the new society look like? Mm. Well, we just have to let go. Mm. It's like being an adolescent and refusing to leave childhood behind. You don't know what you're going to be like as an adult. No, you don't know what it's going to be like to be 40 odd years old. Just let go, move on. Because mm. what you do know is that if you cling on to that childhood, you know, so, <laughs> and I know, we know as you know, what are we, middle-aged? Would you say, are we middle-aged now, are we? Okay, I'm 40. Oh, we, is that middle-aged? We don't feel it, that we were still young, but, but you know what I'm saying? We know uh, yeah. what happens to those that cling on. Yeah. I, I, I bet you you've got friends. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you were clinging on yeah. to that childhood, yeah. <laughs> the dear and, life. And, 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 and from, the, from the world that I was from, you know, where a lot of confusion was there, you know, the, the boys in the wolf pack on the inner mm. city estate where mm. one-upmanship and pushing, see how far you can push him, you do it, no, he did it, oh, he's, he's madder than you are, no, he's mm. tougher than you are, and he's, and we push each other and we push each other, and mm. then when you do get to whatever age it was, you know, I was probably getting on my late 20s when I really started mm. to think, hang on a minute, you know, recognising my pattern, my imprint, mm. Mm. finding myself in the environment at five o'clock in the morning about to, put an iron across someone's head. <laughs> My mates just hit me with the iron, I'm going to hit you with the iron. Who can go, oh, let's keep going. That was a shot of vodka. And then thinking, fuck, you know, what am I doing? You know, this is not good. And I'm mm. in a taxi on the way home, spent all my money, mm. lump on my head, you know, ripped shit out of one of my good mates for eight hours straight. You know, got all sorts of chemicals in me. I can't sleep, I can't eat. You know, I don't, work Monday comes around quick. I'm fucking not operating properly. I'm all over the place. And we're, we're all still doing it. And the call comes mm. on Thursday. Benny's got the bag. We're going out to, <laughs> oh, fucking hell, you know. And then 
you do look around the room at 28, 29, I think, fucking hell, we've had this conversation, we've had everything, you know, like, and then you manage to move through. And that, for me, in my little experience of transition and trying to find my identity, like, mm. to move away from your fundamental group of friends that you've gone through so, such transitional period of your life with, it's a difficult thing because it's everything. It's geographically, it's like, you don't just not go back where you're going because then you get called out and where you been and oh what's fucking wrong with you you're better than us and mm. and it's a difficult thing to try if you have had that little moment where you think hang on a minute you know the drugs aren't doing me any good here the partying mm. the madness the scrapping mm. but I can't really sit and say this to these boys because they're just not going to get it because they're still deep Mm. And then you don't see him, you make that change or I made that change mm. and then it might be eight, ten years later and we are in our forties now and mm. then you see someone and they didn't let go mm. and they're still trying to recreate that mm. fun or that whatever it was, but mm. it's become, it's eating their health, it's mm. at their relationships, mm. you know, it's such a difficult thing to, to, to see and, and you see it permeate into everything. Mm. Everything crumbles. Mm. But we're all, as a culture, we are all growing. Don't you think? And I don't think it's just because we're getting older. I think that the, the kids who are who we were, they're so much wiser than mm. we were. There's mm. so much more information. I know there's a lot of misinformation and nonsense out there as well, and that I know there's a danger to that as well. Oh, yeah. You know, like what did the, the like the different truths? <laughs> you know, you know, um, but they are so much more switched on. We are moving forward, and if you actually dare, anyone who's wondering whether they should dare to move on and move away and grow, because they feel that happening, but they're scared of growing. I'd say, well, you know what, what will actually happen is other people will follow you. When I, when I first moved away, I felt like I had to move away from my mates because I wanted to start being creative. I wrote poems and stuff, but I didn't tell my mates I wrote poems and stuff because that wasn't a cool thing to do. My mates went into rap and all that stuff. This is a white village. So, you know, that wasn't a thing then. Now all the white kids do rap, but not mm. them. Um, so I didn't intend to be a rapper. That wasn't my plan. I just wanted to write stuff. Um, but I didn't, I didn't read books. I was 21 by now. And I was still fighting every weekend, selling drugs, all kinds of nonsense, getting nicked all the time. I didn't read books. And I wanted to know about poetry and creativity. So I went to college, not because I wanted to get back into the education. I hated the education system with a passion. But I wanted just to meet people who know about that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I met this mate who's still me, one of my best mates to this day, Mac. The Mac of all trades, he's a rapper, beatboxer, producer, musician, all around genius, beautiful dude. And he persuaded me, he's got poems, come and rap in our band. I'll introduce you to this other guy. He's used to be this guy, Philly Wiz, and he raps. It's a white lad from St. Helens, he raps. And anyway, and, and I, I looked up to them, I, I thought, oh my God, the creative dude. And then we met this guy, DJ Rasp, who is now one of the most famous scratch DJs mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah, I know that name. One of the best in the world, you know. But he was just some lad from St. Helens. And, and we all felt like outsiders. And now we're all older, we can be honest about it. We all felt like, oh my God, th they've got more than what I've got. But I thought yeah. all of them have got this creative thing. They're all confident with that. And I am just this nutter, this skin-headed, steroided nutter scally <laughs> trying to fit into their world, you know. Um, but then years later, I kind of went back and spoke to me other mates, who I'm still friends with now, we mates that I grew up with. And I remember one of them said to me, we always knew you'd do something like that. Like, nobody ever said to me when I was growing up. Teachers did, to be fair. The only thing teachers ever thought I was good at, apart from running and stuff, because I was very athletic, uh, was writing. A number of teachers said to me, you'll be a writer. You'll be a writer. But yeah, for one of my mates to say to me, and, and, and this was one of, this was like the, the you know, I don't know if he, if he remembers saying that to me, but this is like the toughest guy in our year, you know? Um mm. And, you know, I'll say, I'll say another thing as well. There's, he also, this same guy who was the toughest guy in our year, him and another person who was the toughest girl in our year, yeah? <laughs> they are two of the people who have read me book, fed back to me 
how the book made them feel about their, and what it made them think about. Yeah. And then written reviews for me on Amazon. These were the toughest people in my year at school. <laughs> Do you know what mm, I mean? Mm, yeah. So it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter if maybe at one point someone had, some of them did maybe judge me or talk about I don't know. Maybe they did. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have to move on. You have to dare to move on. And guys in prison will tell you this all the time. And those who don't want you to move on, they're not your mates. Leave them behind. Leave yeah. them behind. Yeah. You get a group of heroin addicts, ask any heroin addict what happens when they try and get off the gear. There'll Just be people try and draw back them back in. I've got a bag there, you want to fancy it? Mm. It's like people feel secure in their little world, in their little rut, if you're in there with them, you know. Mm. Just move on, man. Powerful, powerful advice. And, and isn't it funny, or, or not, it's a strange phenomenon that, you like you, you mentioned the, the, the lad who's the tough kid in the year, mm. who knew then you were going to do something like that. So he said to me, you know, he was drunk. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know if you remember but, saying that. I, but, <laughs> but I pick, pick you up on that, Ash, because I think there is this strange playground yeah. law that, I mean, I refer to it as often as like the wolf pack. Lads mm. are like in the wolf pack, you know, and the alpha wolf says, does, and we all do, you mm. know, and... A lot of us go home in our Adidas gazelles and our fucking Henry Lloyd jackets or whatever it was back then for me, you know. And I didn't even want that jacket, but I knew that jacket was kudos, do you know what I mean? I knew that jacket was vibes. I knew it was fucking level. And then we also know that I recognise, because like, I was in bands, so I did get a bit of stick because I was a footballer, athletic. Football got me a long way. So mm. my kind of profile in school if you like I was in, in the gang with the lads mm. you know the tough kids and the footballers and I played for the county and all that stuff mm. scored goals but then I was in bands as well and I might wear a wacky fucking cravat scarf or some mad suede fucking slip on shoes mm. and I'd get some stick but I had enough kind of geezer kudos to mm. kind of so I was brave enough to f bounce that off me and then I would I would kick around with some of the kids that might be considered the dweebs mm -hmm. or the whatever, you mm -hmm. know, the geeks. Mm -hmm. And I had enough to let that bounce off. So I felt quite lucky in that way. But then I would I would I look back now and I think in a similar way, like I've spoken to lads who come and see my bands much later on who who, who were like so proud and so mm -hmm. like when it when it first came about that I was singing in a band, I, this stick I got about being some faggot singer who thinks he's fucking this and that and the other mm. and fucking sing us a song, you know. And then these people would be in the front row at the gigs, you know, when we were a couple of years out of school or whatever. Like, fucking, we like, we became their spokespeople. They they mm. revered what we were doing. They got mm. it all of a sudden. And I'd speak to a couple of them similarly, and they, they knew it then. Mm. But what is it about that wolf pack law where we can't mm. be... Mm. Lads can't seem to say something sensitive and mm. nice to one another. And mm. you said something earlier about the way we speak to our kids. You're a father, mm. yeah? Mm. Me too. You, I know I try and cultivate a line of communication. Mm. I try and cultivate a freedom mm. and an ability to speak about whatever it is. And mm. I mean whatever it is, Absolutely. you know, where sometimes you might think from our generation, if there's a camera on the wall, people might think, well, you can't talk to your kids, you know, if it was in my house. But for me, it's like, no, everything mm. is wide open because I hope that, that mm. carries through. Mm. And maybe when they are with their mates, they can create an energy enough to mm. try and have that communication mm. open. Mm. and not shut each other down because you mm. shut yourself down it's so important and it's so important to be honest with the kids so one of the stories I often tell I work in schools a lot and uh, I talk to the kids about ADHD is one of the things I've done recently and I've said this in assemblies in classrooms in front of teachers and head teachers and I keep thinking one day they're going to pull me up and kick me out of the school no one's ever actually criticised what I'm saying so I gather that they agree, and some teachers indeed have gone, will you come and tell, come and tell the other staff what you just said to the kids? I'm like, wow, they want this honesty? Because one of the things I say to them is, look, if the school system, the school system is imperfect, okay? 
SATs is about the SATs, yeah? That's about ticking boxes for the government to give figures. It's, it's a bureaucratic system. It's not actually about... Um, it's not about enlightening you. It's not about getting you excited about learning. It's about box ticking. To, and the teachers... If you want to know what teachers think about SATs, go and have a look at... A few years ago, there was an NUT conference and it was all over YouTube and the news and teachers were getting on stage and crying... I want to inspire these kids and I'm just have to tick these boxes and do these stupid tests. Crying. That's what the, but the teachers, for some reason, think they can't tell you that, that they don't agree with the system, mm. that the system's imperfect. And for some reason, your parents think they have to pretend that they think the system is perfect. And then if you don't fit in, as over, I would say, over half of you don't mm. fit in to this imperfect system because of the system's imperfections, you're made to think that those imperfections are yours. Yeah, yeah, your fault. They're putting on you. Like, you've done something wrong. And I'm here to tell you, you ain't done nothing wrong. You don't, if you don't like sitting there all day on a rock hard chair while someone tells you what to think or tries to get you to do some bloody fronted adverbial or some nonsense. They don't again, believe in it. The teachers don't even know what front of that verbial is. We know what the writers don't know what front of that verbial is. Linguistics <laughs> <laughs> professors know what front of that verbial is. And if you if you don't find that interesting, then they'll make you feel like it's your fault. Even though your teachers don't think it's your fault and your parents don't think it's your they know it's the system. The but momentum. they won't tell you that. Mm. What's going on? Mm. And I say this to uh, head teachers and teachers all the time. I give them the example of my kids being like a social experiment. <laughs> how, how old are your kids, actually? I've got a 14-year-old boy and a 10-year-old girl. Right. And I say, my kid's like a social experiment, because I was certain that this way would work, dishonesty. But who knows, because I'd never been a parent before. And, but now, here we go, my son is now 14, and I told him that in primary school, Jordan. Sat- it, are they in school then? Are they with yeah, they're yeah. in the school system in senior school and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. And when my son was doing the SATs, Year six, is it? Year five, year six, year six, right. isn't it? The, the end of primary, yeah. Um, he was getting all worried about it. Now, I live on the Wirral, where we still have grammar schools. There's only a few places in the country that still have grammar schools. If you pass the 11 plus, you can go to the fancy grammar school. And, you know, it's, that's a highly imperfect system. But the other, the other choices were awful. The comprehensives were awful right. in our area. So we were getting him through, you know, uh, revising for the 11 plus exam. And he was worried about his sats. And I said, so I don't, I can't care about sats, son. And I showed him the teachers crying about sats. I said, your, your teachers don't like the sats, it's a nonsense, don't worry about it. I said, you know what? Take the day off. I'll phone up, say you're not well. Take it off. Love that. And he's like, can I? Yeah, of course you can. Said, but if you're going to go in and do them, you'll do them properly. Or don't do them at all. Do it properly. Or not at all. The system's imperfect, but you decide what you want out of the system, the yeah. imperfect system. For don't you. wait around for it to be perfect because yeah. you'll be waiting a long time and don't think you're going to change it overnight. Don't think you're like Jesus, Buddha and John Lennon combined and you're <laughs> going to make it happen because even Jesus, Buddha, John Lennon combined with Malcolm X jumping in as well didn't do it. <laughs> so what are you going to do? So what are you going to get out of it? Same with the prison system. Yeah. That's what I say to the fans, but what are you going to get out of it? And people might think that's dangerous to be that honest with a 10 year old kid. But he went in, and he's dyslexic. And he smashed his sats, and passed the 11 plus. And he's now in grammar school, preparing for his GCSEs, and doing very well, thank you. Mm. Understanding that he's working within an imperfect system. I think that's really important, what you just said there, because as listeners of this podcast know, and we've done a, a, an episode recently with um, an unschool, unschooling the kids family who've got their kids out of school. I've got small kids. My kids are younger than yours, seven, nearly six and three. And me and my wife took them out of school just last year because we believe the system doesn't, is imperfect, certainly for us. Mm-hmm. And in, it, it, you know, on, on a macro level, as I look at it, I see conformity, I see something trying to be a system that can feed everybody but mm. it becomes one size fits all and mm. all the things you just mentioned happen but what i like what you just said is and what i'm learning from all of the families and the people that and, and the reading i'm doing about unschooling and the, the journey we're about to embark on is it really does come down to that open dialogue mm. and that choice because mm. the best learning any learning and we know as adults you've mm. you've educated yourself later on in life mm. when you choose to learn something because you're mm. driven toward it 
that is imprinting emotionally and, mm. and uh, you know in your processing mm. of your this, this the, the want and the need for that information mm. comes in quicker mm. and it stays for longer yep. and giving your boy that choice and saying you know it's cool and, and, mm-hmm. and the honesty of yeah it's fucking it's bent out of shape and it don't mm-hmm. it don't work and you're all right it's cool no one's heavy on you if you want to do it go for it if you don't doesn't matter we'll figure mm-hmm. something out that's so important absolutely and the the the, the, the chat i had ironically says so pointing this out because i think it's quite it's quite poignant for this this part of this conversation is the unschooling family um that had done this for like 10 years that we interviewed recently or conversed with i like to say because interviews this is not a formal this is mm-hmm. this is life chat mm-hmm. they said ironically their girls got to twin girls got to like 15 mm-hmm. and some uh, exams sort of came up as a, as a as a thing when they'd done this kind of really kind of just bohemian living learning you know mm-hmm. just following the nose and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, what's a, what? We can do an exam. It's like, what's an exam? Well, an exam is, is it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's a. If you, it's, if you wanted to be a writer, we might have to do these exams mm. to qualify for this and go in this direction. Oh, mm. right, cool. Can we do one? I said, yeah, you can do one. Yeah. Oh, cool. And they were like, right, okay. What do you want to do? Like, well, they'd lived in Italy for a while and they spoke Italian a little bit, so they're like, let's do one on Italy. So they, I think they registered it somewhere where they could do them, uh, in Bristol somewhere, and they did revising and they were so they come bursting out of the room. They loved it. They had little timers. They went and did the exam, they aced it. They come out, the guy who'd done the exam was like, to the parents, like, never see, these kids came flying out. They, like, they mm-hmm. loved the experience. Mm-hmm. They chose to do it. Mm-hmm. They knew the system mm-hmm. wasn't necessarily what it had been sold to us on a, on a, on a, mm-hmm. you know, a larger scale, mm-hmm. but they had chosen to do it. Mm-hmm. And whether or not those grades are going to mean everything or anything in the future is, mm-hmm. was not the point. The point mm-hmm. was is that, as a, yeah, as, as a, measuring device mm. they've aced it mm. but they, they, what seems to be the most fundamental thing is they chose to do it mm. they pushed themselves in in ways that would by their own divine Indeed. pursuit yep. beautiful that's what learning is you get passionate about something that you want to know something that you want as part of your life and you go and learn it that's education the other thing is better described as indoctrination Mm. think what we tell you to think yeah. about this thing what to think not what how to think indeed why aren't they teaching critical thinking now where where, te- where studies have been done where they have taught had philosophers come in and teach critical thinking those kids have then done better in school overall of course in schools there's there's one school not far from us um in Ormskirk where they do uh, meditation every day and them kids get uh, overall much much better results as i'm sure you are aware statistically home educated kids get much better gcse results than those in the comprehensive system mm. they do better mm. it's not because they're smarter it's because they've given <laughs> a sense of freedom and honesty and trust yeah and i want to bring us to this then so rise up mm. we, we you know we're not going to go too much further in jamaica because i'm reading it and i want people to go and get this book because <laughs> you need to be immersed in this but as we move further down the timeline of your life, you, mm. you know, as you mentioned there, at 21, you, you sort of have a moment where you like, you start to read, you want to educate, you go back to college, mm. you start meeting people, you follow your creativity, mm. you start to educate yourself. Mm. Much further down the line, what, six, seven years ago, some, something like that, how long? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're October 2015, we registered the company after a year of research. So yeah, about that, yeah. And that's Rise Up. So if mm. you want to just find Rise Up online, um, this this is your manual, which I've been looking through, mm. which you give to everybody who comes and you work with. Mm. Actually, you didn't rise up, yeah. Um, I mean, this itself, I mean, the philosophy in it, the little quotes, mm. again, like the book, although in a very different way, you know, the book is a, a, a creative, you know, beautiful weaving storytelling. Mm. But this... This encapsulates kind of wisdom mm. in a, and it still has that smoothness, you know, and that that narrative runs through of, mm. of everything you're talking about now, like chasing some meaning, like mm. identity, mm. how to think. Because mm. I love what you've said in the previous, I think, was it on Condo Radio? I saw, oh, yeah. I watched you on there with those guys, really enjoyed that. But you, you said something really simple, but really poignant, which is just trying to work out how to be all right. Mm. And I think you, you phrased it as thoughts, feelings, action. Mm-hmm. 
just that, just, just that. how to be all right, how mm. to work out how you feel mm. and how to minimise the stress and just mm. be okay. Mm. Beautiful. Mm. So how, I mean, I guess this is this is a, an accumulation of that journey, of that travel, of this wonder, mm. of this education, and then a way of feeding it back to people. So, you know, so take us through Rise Up. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I... As I say, the whole rap thing got me into working in the community arts eventually. I was lucky enough to know somebody who works at the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra mm. and they wanted to kind of make their image a bit cooler and get younger people and working class people, get, you know, kind of break down this stuffy middle age, middle class image of classical music. And the guy who ran the orchestra was for a friend of ours. He said, well, let me bring in some of my friends who were rappers, DJs, jazz musicians. Let's let's go in the schools and do some cool projects. And at the, for about 17 years, then I worked with the Philharmonic, rapping with classical music in schools, mental health units, that kind of thing. And I, I ran a company, an arts and education company too, when we had the new Labour government. They were putting a lot of money into getting artists into schools. There was a thing called creative partnerships in each local creative partnerships office got about five million quid a year. Wow. It was a huge project. That feels like that's long gone at this moment. Well, the I really knew when the Tories got in that that was dead. That's when I left me other business. This never lasts. The Tories take money out of the arts and the humanities. But it'll come back. That's fine. Um, so, yeah, so uh, for seven years I ran an arts and education company, getting artists into schools all over the country, running these projects. But the whole time, what I wanted to do really, my passion, I contacted every prison in the country a number of times. And I never even got a single no thanks, because that's a difficult... It's, it's funny when you're trying to get into the prisons, they don't want you, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> when you're just trying to chill out with your mates and have a spliff, they want you in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you get you paid know. for that bit, don't they? They, get, they earn something from that bit. <laughs> but yeah, so I couldn't get in there. Um, it was very, very difficult. So then the Tories privatised part of the probation service, which was typical Tory, cynical, money for your mates project but what i saw there was opening of the door for a second some of that money was meant to go to work with the third sectors that means like charities cic's all that kind of thing social enterprises because what they recognize or what they said they recognize was that people who do it in the charity sector third sector we do it we have a vested interest that's why we do what we do and what we do works and what the probation service is doing obviously fails massively that's not the staff's fault it's the system okay just like the education system it's not the teacher's fault they good people who go into that work because they want to make a difference and then the hands are tied anyway I saw that door open so I went to a friend of mine Cod you know, as I call him Stuart Cody my business partner who was much more kind of he'd, he'd, he'd been like he, well, not a salesperson kind of an accounts manager in the corporate world okay mm. So I said to him, look, I've got the creative maniac thing going on. You've got the corporate bit going. You be the manager, I'll be the maniac. And nicked that line, by the way, off the fellow who started Bulky Bobs in Liverpool. Right. He says every, every, uh, every social enterprise needs a maniac and a manager, you know. So I'll be the maniac, you be the manager. Let's do this thing. And we spent a year researching, so we're going to go into prison. But what do we want to do? It's fair play doing some rap or something and getting people in the room. But what do we want to actually share with them? How is it? that you are get to be okay, feel good about yourself? How is it you get to communicate well, get to calm your nerves, get a good night's sleep? How is it you get to become the kind of person who doesn't switch because somebody else wants you to, who doesn't start kicking off or blaming somebody else? When you do that, I just kick off. No, 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 they did something. And you're saying they made you kick off. Well, isn't that quite dangerous? Mm. And if, if they, if you mate... Oh, you, 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 your wife, some some idiot you've never even met at the bus stop can make you do something. What do you think the system can do to you? Jesus. What are the police doing to you? What are the screws doing? <laughs> what are the politicians be able to do? You understand? Mm -hmm. So how is it you become that person who has full control? I'm not saying I have full control and, and never uh, get stressed or whatever, but we're all, you know, works in progress. How do you become that person who is on that path to self-actualization. Very few people actually reach what you might call actualization or enlightenment or mm. peace, whatever, yeah, whatever you yeah. want to call it. Yeah, yeah, let's keep it simple, mate. It's just being okay. Yeah. That's why I loved the way you said it, because it <laughs> you meant know. everything to me. Yeah, you simplified yeah, it. Just being okay. But um, how do you become... So we, we, we studied and studied and studied. We went and met with Liverpool John Moores University numerous times with their criminology department. 
we went and met with numerous uh, psychologists, psychotherapists, psychiatrists, NLP practitioners, CBT practitioners, transactional analysis practitioners, and we developed a program. It's a 12 step program. And the, the arts is what gets people in the room, it's what builds the rapport, it's what gets people relaxed and being honest. And every session is run by, like, to simplify, an artist and a therapist. And we don't do therapy. We don't do therapy. We teach the prisoners the techniques that the therapist knows. So I don't say, you tell me your problems, mate, and I'll tell you how to be better. <laughs> I'll tell you how to be just like me. Nonsense. We say, here's the technique. Here's a technique that you can walk out of this room now and start using right now. If I'm going to put you on the spot and see if you can do it, let's go. Mm-hmm. And like some of that's in here, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, uh, and the, the, the 12 sessions are based on a journey. It's a narrative arc itself. Yeah, you get that. And, and you talk about Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey and that comes just, through. Just love Joseph. You see, see how I light up when you say, you say his yeah. name. It's yeah. just... Yeah, I love Joseph Campbell, and indeed that's in locks as well, isn't it? The hero's yeah. journey. Um, yeah. I'm trying to just to give people a taste of how that works in life. Why is it that we've told the same story over and over again for thousands of years in every part of the world? How would that be? Why would that be? And what's the point? Well, we all have the same experiences, you know. Mm-hmm. We all live, die. We're all born of a woman. We all see the sun live and die every. day. Day and night. We all see the moon live and die every month. The sun lives and dies on a, on a more protracted scale every year. Mm. Uh, the animals and the plants that we kill to eat just live, die, and re- life, death, and rebirth. We all have that side. Also, we all have challenges to overcome. Mm. Uh, we all have moments in life whereby life seems to go, Are you going to dare to come on this journey? As our society is now at that point, we're at the beginning of a hero's journey, our society. Are you going to dare to cross the threshold? And then who takes our hand? But someone older, someone wiser, a mentor, Obi Wan Kenobi, or whatever you know, mm. Gandalf, or whatever, comes along and takes your hand. Let's go. Let's dare. And then once you go there, oh, I'll dare. Oh my God! Everything's falling away. You you stop being the drug dealer, for example, and you lose all that money, and you go vroom. You're down there now. So you were here. You don't want to be there anymore. But rather than what, what most people do, they go, I don't want to be here anymore at point A. And they just push their energy out all over the place. I don't know where they're going. I say this to people all the time. You're moaning about your wife. You're moaning about the police. You're moaning about society. Where do you want to be? If you don't like where you are, where do you want to be? I don't know. Well, stop moaning then. And decide where you're going to. So you're heading in a direction, mate. Teach you jumping in your car going, I want to go somewhere. Just get off. Yeah. Well, where, where are you going, mate? Yeah. So, here's point A. So, you start moving towards point B. And you dare to cross the threshold and everything's gone, isn't it? Your identity, maybe your friends, maybe the money, whatever it is, it's gone. Mm-hmm. So you're down there, rock bottom is at point C, yeah? But now you start building back up. And by the time you get past higher than the level you were at here, you get up there, you're at a new point now, mm. that point D. But that's point A, because now you start again and you move on again, if you know where you're going. And But you get higher each time. It's like that, that whole analogy of walking around the mountain Every time you get to the next level, you come back to the exact same point on the mountain, but you're a bit higher up. I like that, yeah. Or you're just scattering your energy all over the place and moaning about society, moaning about Trump or moaning about Boris Johnson or whatever. Mm. You have your right to your anger, you have your right to your indignancy. But what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? That's what matters, you know. Mm. And building, building your own character, building yourself, building your trajectory, building your path, building your world inside this world. And taking some responsibility for yourself. Yeah. Stop waiting around for somebody else to change something that's going to make it okay for you. Mm. It's not going to happen. As far as I'm aware in the whole history of civilization, it's never been anywhere near perfect. I don't know of a utopian society. I have plenty of friends who believe in Atlantis, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying I disagree. I don't know, but mm. I don't. I don't know historically <laughs> of a utopian society that's ever existed. I don't know how it in can. Civilization. When, you, when you like you mentioned the moon, the sun, dark light, you know, yin yang, de- life, death. How can utopia? You can't have it with death because death is 
this beautiful learning escapade that is so painful. Mm. But without it, we don't learn about mm. being here now and the beauty mm. of life. And there is so much information out there. Now, if you start on that path, start on that journey, my gosh, there's, there's no excuse, man, because there's so much information. You don't have to be able to read and write. You know, go and talk to your mate. Google it. Mm. Videos podcasts, blogs, books, right at the back of your right ear there, Sam is the chimp paradox, you know. Mm -hmm. These books weren't out when we were younger. Mm. We didn't have all that knowledge all around us. That is so easy to read. Mm. Diagrams that shows you, this this dude knows, this this is the dude, this is Liverpool FC, Professor Steve Peters. Mm -hmm. This is the guy who got the, the, one of the best football, I'm not into football, so please don't go there, but one of the best football teams in the world to be the way they are by controlling their minds, by understanding how your brain works and how you can get a grip of it and make sure nobody else can make you feel like you're loser. How you can use your body as well. Posture. Posture to influence that. Because that, mm. that's a loser, isn't it? Mm. You've lost. Low. It's, it's funny how that all comes in with low frequency. Like you hold yourself low, you want to lay down, you, you you shrink, you, you enclose. Whereas when you hold your shoulders up and you put your chin in the air and you take responsibility, you have a good posture, you're up straight, you, you to be recognised. Imagine you saying Bolt. Can we not laugh? You know what I mean? <laughs> and obviously not everybody deals with it perfectly. Mike Tyson. Have you read Tyson's autobiography? I've Did not, you I haven't truth? read I haven't read his book, but I watch everything I can of him his, and I've, I've learned a lot about him. Well, yeah. you know you know Custom Martel then was into yes, this this Italian no guy, I can't remember his name, but he was into all this mind control stuff and meditation yeah. and everything. Yeah. And he taught him to do this thing. John Lennon quotes this guy as yeah. well, every day and every way I'm getting better and better. Yeah. In a beautiful boy, John yeah. Lennon sings it. Um but well, Mike Tyson got into that. No, he didn't deal with it perfectly. I believe Customato had a lot of uh, had a lot of angst and uh, aggression and resentment as well, and they took it a bit too far. I think. Yeah, they and Mike Tyson him, didn't they? Into yeah, being a machine. Mike Tyson turned himself into a crazy thing, like a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. But I love Mike Tyson so these much. These days, he's, what he's expressing oh, these days is wonderful. Again, he gives me shivers just to think about him. But he knows he took it too far. Mm. That whole thing. He was like, I'll. Kill it. Yeah. You know, I'm, it was, I'm, I'm Alexander the Great, I'm yeah. Julius Caesar, you tried to, because he's into his history, isn't yeah. he? You tried to feed me. But that's why that guy could go out. And do what he did. Taking cocaine, smoking weed, drinking beer, it's sleeping in, with girls. And the next day, beat up the toughest guy in the world. Yeah. <laughs> because of what was happening here. Mm. Mm. Just doing that doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. As I say, with Mike's story. You know, it's, it's the way you do it. But there's no excuse if you want to take that journey. There's no excuse. Mm. Because there's so much information for you now. And you point that out beautifully. And as you mentioned, books, Ashley, as well. And you, jo with Joseph Campbell, I mean, I haven't mm. read any of Joseph Campbell's stuff, but I've listened to him because I can go on YouTube and probably exactly. people, young 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 men watching this now might hate Joseph Campbell, you know, see an old guy from the 70s sat in some chair, he's just talking. And if you stick with it, he will chime on where you're at and where you could be. And, it, and it's there and you can hit, you know, I've done this with Alan Watts and Terence McKenna and, you know, so many of these guys. I mean, I'm, I've got this book. This book, uh, in fact, where is it? Is it the C Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly nice. P. Hall, who I've had this book for a long time. It was gifted to me. And I knew a little bit about Manly P. Hall and, and the idea of him being this this guy who's followed symbolism right back. And it's only recently where I've started to listen to his lectures, mm. you know, and I think he was born in 1901. There's a lot of this stuff's been found and it's been reconditioned so you can hear it well. And he's talking about it is the hero's journey it's, it's dignity it's ownership mm. it's respect mm. it's simplicity mm. and I'm I've, I've learned so much from podcasts I mean podcasts like books you know yeah. especially to be that bridge to the lad in the wolf pack mm. you know mm. someone cool like Mike Tyson who you mm. think you respect because he's the best boxer and then you hear him talk for two hours about mm. what it was like when he was a kid mm. what it was like when he was a custom auto, mm. what it was like when he was in jail mm. and all of a sudden you, you, you get past the kind of ego and the the, the hierarchical sort of positioning and mm. then you start to mm. realise oh this is a person who's broken as well and like and you're, you're privy to it all and, mm. and you're a part of it all mm. Pod, the, inf the information is, is it is abundant mm. now and mm. so many of us can access it and mm. we can change the page but you put it beautifully there you know yeah it does mean a lot of the time that we 
we descend from whatever this thing is we've built. You know, I am the alpha wolf with mm. my boys and I'm the one who supplies mm. the thing and I'm the party star mm. or I'm the one with the car or whatever the fuck mm. it is. If you're willing mm. and you can trust and believe, mm. and find some support, you can... And I feel it from you. Like, I feel that. Like, even as far as I am into the book, listening to you talk in the bits that I've seen, that energy, you've distilled it and it's a fucking you know and you're taking it in these prisons you've mm. forced your way in by the sound of it into these prisons Absolutely. when you sent me the package you know with the, with the stuff that such a well produced you can feel the care i mean i've made music and i've tried to pay attention to making artwork and packaging mm. things that when you like when mm. i've sent t-shirts out from this podcast I package them, I put little label, you know, try, the Ooh, energy of, you know, I found mm. myself ironing these fucking labels and I was thinking, fucking hell, this is taking me ages, you know, mm. for my little podcast. Mm. Not because I'm making money, not because because I want someone to get this thing because they've listened to this mm. podcast and I want to gift them this thing and I want them to feel mm. this is coming from somewhere. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mm. mean this and I get that mm. from you the, abundantly. Mm. The energy, the, 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 the love... What's the reward like, Ashley? When you do, when you when you when you set up Rise Up, mm. you know, and obviously I didn't realise you had such a history of working within the arts and, mm. and education and helping mm. people anyway. So you obviously had a good confidence and and, and you had a, a kind of a roadmap, I imagine, in your mind where you could mm. you could see this door open, as you put it. Mm. When you finally did manage to get into the prisons and connect with these guys, and you mm. saw your plan come through, because this is this this twelve step manual is pretty significant. You mentioned it, NLP. You've got. Mm. When you start to see that come together and you start to see guys benefiting, mm. this, that's got to be one of the best rewards mm. there is on the, on the planet. Absolutely. The, 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 there's dudes that still contact me now. In fact, I've just, I just pulled up here that I've got a text from one of the guys, who a granddad. He was a granddad when he was in prison and it was during, he'd tell you himself, he was out now, it was during a Rise Up session about eight, nine lessons, classes, sessions into a rise up course that he just stood up and went, I've got to say something. That's the, pe I've, 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 I've the penny's just dropped. I've just, I've just realised. I, I, I didn't get it at first, but I see what you're doing now. He said, I just, I've just had this realisation. I, I don't want to be this weird old guy who's in and out of prison anymore. I just want to be a, a dad and a granddad. And that moment, as I say, you know, we still we're, we're in contact regularly now. Um, we send each other messages and stuff. And he's he's out now. Um, he's before lockdown happened. The probation service were training him up to mentor other people. But this guy had been dealing with alcoholism and drug addiction for decades, and in the meantime, had had kids and grandkids. And during the rise up course, yeah, just so so the, the reward is. You know, the happiest people in the world, so sociological studies will tell you, the happiest people in the world are those that work to help other people. Because that's just naturally inbuilt in us. We would not have survived as a species if we didn't have this thing that we have decided to label as love or empathy. If that wasn't part of us, if we weren't able to take the baby and keep it alive because it's useless when it comes out, isn't it? It's not, it's not like mm. a, the horse that drops out and it's walking around a few minutes. Like, yeah. It can't do anything for a couple of years. Yeah. So we have to have a real deep empathy and love for us to even survive. And I believe that goes even deeper. I believe empathy and love is just one way of expressing the thing of which we are actually made. As you probably know from reading this stuff, you probably read a bit of quantum physics and that mm. kind of stuff. You know, scientists now agree with the, the ancient mystics. You know, the universe... The scientific fact the universe is all connected every atom in the universe mm -hmm. is in interaction with everything else yeah and we don't understand what the stuff is in between the atoms so we give it these weird terms dark matter dark energy whatever because dark meaning don't know mate we don't know yeah. <laughs> but it's connected mm. and before it started expanding if you are into science that way of explaining things the big bang it was all in a singularity it was just the same stuff but there was no space so I am you. Yeah. I am that tree, that, that camera, mm. that bottle of, what's that, Bailey's cream or whatever yeah. it is. Well, that, that, that's me. <laughs> we have mm. it. Mm. It is us. So therefore we have no option but to empathise with it. 
on a deep level to love it because it is you. Mm. You have no choice. That's and so the other profound. stuff, the other stuff is just layers of mental shit. Mm. Put on some silt, silt. Put on top of that clear water. You know, mm. it's just garbage. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you have no. Oh so yeah, th- you, that's you, the reward. We touch, like, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I have psychedelic tendency and understanding, which I think, you know, when you talk about quantum physics and you talk about the science and the Big Bang and mm. the, the, that that. That crosses over for me, and science yeah. is showing that now. I mean, maps are the multi. They're looking at the, what we can do in the way of therapy with plant medicines. Absolutely, it's all coming back now. That are, that are bringing us back to that mm. meaning, that point of truth, that point of mm. interconnectivity. Mm. When when you were putting this together, then because mm. it is significant mm. in the way of you've got NLP, and I mean, take us through it. How mm. did you go out and learn all this stuff? Were you did mm. you put yourself in in the frame to 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 be mm. um yeah to, to understand these facets mm. knowing that one thing will connect to the next and we can mm. create this 12 rounded steps that that arrive at this place and and did you have surprises along the way did you learn things about yourself along the way god no, no, fuck. We, we, we researched for a year before even registering the company at first it was a, a clean language based program which clean language therapy is just a way of asking questions and again, I've only studied this, I've done the weekend courses, that kind of thing, so I'm not a practitioner. But it's just a way of asking questions that get you into um, thinking metaphorically. Okay. So it's like, well, they just they just always, they, they always piss me off. And you don't question anything, you just keep repeating what they're saying yeah. and asking it back to them. Oh, they, they, they always piss you off. You know, and they even copy the action. Why they, do you they, think they, that they always is? piss you off. Yeah. Well, well, well. Actually, what they say is clean language. What kind of pissed off? Well, you know, like, like, just like a swag. Like, what a just like. Blah, you just want to. Okay, and and where does that? You know, and Let's what see. happens next? Let's well, see. I just want to explode. Explode. Okay. What kind of explosion? Where is the explosion? And what what's it like? And what next? And, and trust me, it just goes, within a couple of questions, you can end up in a trance state. Wow. You know, it goes deeper and deeper. Because again, the power of metaphor, this is why we have story and analogy and, 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 and myth and poetry. That's why songs are so powerful. Yeah, Rap songs, the Beatles, it hits so deep, Motown songs, reggae songs, because it, it deals with that part, because the metaphor gets into the unconscious part of the mind. Mm. Which is, as you'll well know, you know the, the, the conscious mind's the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. The actual iceberg is all underneath the water. And yeah. that's the and all the dark stuff is pushed down there and all the stuff that we don't actually consciously remember, but it, it's still there. Everything that happens, everything you've experienced, everything's coming through your senses, through your whole life, it's stored there somewhere, you know. So metaphor gets into that level. And again, if it's done safely, you can kind of release the energy of the unconscious until... Well, again, if you ever really, really connected the conscious and the unconscious and maybe what you might call a super conscious or collective conscious or whatever, that bit that's like the wider consciousness, the universal mm. consciousness, yeah. um, then you'd be enlightened, which I'm not. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but, you know, we're all a work in progress. Um, so anyway, it doesn't really matter what the technique is. We ended up going with NLP, CBT, transactional analysis, mainly a bit of mindfulness and that kind of thing, just because it seemed like the best way to piece together the journey we wanted to take people on. And we're still changing and experimenting with things and learning things and trying things out and going, well, that that went a bit over people's heads, that one, so let's not bother with that one anymore. And, you know, what are the simple techniques that we can use right now that you can go into a room full of yeah, there's practical pr- pr- prisoners? Mm. Some of the most hardcore... Honestly, I've been in the room with, like, you know, armed robbers and kidnappers and it, murderers, multiple murderers who work in high, high security. High security hospitals, Ashworth as well. You know, mm. so, so people who are deemed to be the most dangerous people in the country. Now, how are you going to speak to someone who's had those kind of experiences and give them something that they're going to actually take on board and be able to use practically, immediately to make life better, more productive for them. So 
we just thought it was experimenting. And even this booklet, there's a few bits at the back there that we decided, well, we'll lose them bits because that's a bit, oh, bit bit much. We don't. There's there's simpler things that we that we can give people in the booklet that they can use. You can keep coming back to as well and go, what was that again? And, mm. and there's also the sciencey bits, isn't there? You know how the uh, how the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems actually what 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 is actually happening in fight or flight. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Mm. You'd be dead without it. Mm. How can you harness it so it benefits you? All that kind of stuff. You know, it's just this as life, as me, as you, as this society, as our communities. It's just a living, breathing, a, a work in progress. Mm. <laughs> we just keep moving, you know. Mm. No, that's <laughs> beautiful, man. And when when you say you keep moving, so. In this situation that we found ourselves in in, in this mm. last year, where humanity really is being tested, mm. our hive consciousness, if you like, our hive mental health, you mm. know, our instincts versus our our heart head conundrum, you know, mm. the, the the din of the television or the radio or the, the media telling us mm. one thing our feelings and our actual experience maybe telling us another mm. we are at full stretch i mean have you still been able to do what it is you do during this time in the prisons and in the schools and what does the future look like and what do you see the impact the long-lasting impact of, of this period being and, and that's we don't even know when this fucking thing's gonna do whatever it does you know mm. are we 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 thought it's going to be over. It, it, it seems like it's um, the first. But we, we've in HMP Bristol, which is where we had our biggest contract um, at the time that the lockdown started. We've written the course up um, into written for as well as the course manual. There's also like a, a package that I've written and put together uh, with some of the creative kind of uh, te- I don't say techniques, but the activities as well as this stuff, so here's how to put together like a, a, a poem in this way or a rap in that way or you know, that kind of thing that gets you into enjoying the process of learning the techniques. And that's that's going down really well in Bristol. That's getting put into the cells and guys are learning from that themselves. Um, I'd like to get that into other places. We wanted to get it onto a, as a kind of video course, but the, there's like one company that's really cornered that market in the prisons at the moment. I haven't managed yet to get in touch with them and um, and see if we can put together a package with them so it could go on the screen in the prisons. Yeah. We'll carry on going either way. There has been, where there's been gaps whereby we can do things uh, and it's allowed us, I've still got out there and done some sessions in the community with young people, young carers, um, and, and, and young people who are in care as mm. well. I'm doing something with some young people who are homeless um, in a couple of weeks in um, in Salford, Manchester. By Manchester. <laughs> yeah. Salford. Sorry, Salford. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, 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 we'll carry on. And, yeah, this thing will move on. Um, and we will just... Uh, we will uh, just keep moving, keep living day by day, folks. You know, um, make the most of the situation as it is. Do whatever you can to use this situation to benefit yourself. Mm. And eventually, we will move on out of this situation, and it'll seem like it'll seem like the, the distant past. Yeah, you know. As far as the impact of this on society, I, I know this is a really difficult time for a lot of people, so I wouldn't dream of playing that down. Um, but there is an opportunity. Every challenge is an opportunity mm. to make change, and on a wider societal and consciousness level, I would say. This situation, it gives us amazing potential for positive change. We're realising how much we need other people. We're realising you can't live as an island. We're realising how much we need the arts and creativity in our lives. We're realising that we have to empathise with each other. We're realising that actually... What we're trying to do now, for example, with the vaccines and stuff, like hoarding them in developed countries and bickering over which developed countries can have them first. And all of us must be looking at the TV screen and thinking, this is absolutely disgraceful. I'm Mm. embarrassed. Mm. 
to be a part of this. But that's good. It's good for us to look at, you know, if, if we're the adolescents, <laughs> if our society is, is the adolescents going through the growing pains, then the society, the societal structures, the institutions is, yep. is the parents. Yeah. Yeah. And where we have to come to a point whereby we realise we have to, in, in all the, the old myths, the child overcomes the parent. Not only does better than the parent, and I know it's all very patriarchal, we have this patriarchal society that's yeah. been going on for thousands of years, so we're not the Greek myths and Roman myths and all that, it's this, 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 the, the son overcoming the father, yeah. That's just because of the patriarchal system. We haven't got time to probably go into why we have that. Read Joseph Campbell, folks. <laughs> He'll explain it to you. You know, we used to have the goddesses. Everyone worshiped goddesses. That's natural. We're all born of a woman. But anyway, mm. now it's my own thing. Anyway, um, overcoming the father, overcoming the parent, and then reaching atonement with the parent. So we have to overcome the societal structures and institutions, under see their weaknesses, do better than them, but not blame them. That also atone with them. Yeah. Find peace with them. And uh and then become one with the great father <laughs> and mother. Mm. Connect. You understand? Mm. Um we're not gonna we're not gonna achieve anything by killing the parents, by tearing it down by storming into the capital and smashing things up or whatever. I understand people's indignity. I understand people's anger. Mm. I think that's beautifully put, man. We, we, we it, It's a, such a difficult thing because the, the momentum of our society, those structures you talk of, those systems, those authoritative parameters that we, we live by, they've been brought into the light enormously mm. in this last 12 months enormously mm. and we like with any struggle mm. it is when you are in the deepest part of struggle when you can sometimes actually see for what it is that you're doing that you're part of that's happening and i think yeah it's like it's like mum and dad are suddenly have a nervous breakdown and you go oh my god because as, as a kid i thought mum and dad were like the gods I thought they were perfect. I thought they, 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 they knew everything. And we're now looking at them going, oh, mum and dad are right messy, aren't they? Mm, mm. <laughs> right. Well, I don't really want to be like that. I don't want my kids to be brought up like that. That's so, really nice you've put yeah. it that way, Ashley, because I've had that feeling. I've been coming to terms with that. I mean, I left the country and moved to Thailand at like 31 with my family, my youngest son, mm -hmm. and we, my second son was born in Thailand. And I was at that crossroads where I felt like the struggles I'd had with my parents growing up, particularly my mum, I felt like I'd outgrown her. I felt like I'd become an adult. And all this time, I thought you guys all knew, you know, I was, one day I was going to become an adult and, I'll, and then I'll know what's going on like all the adults know. Then I became an adult. And then I realised, oh, you don't have a clue. Mm. And not only did you not have a clue, a lot of the things that we've been taught and that we've been doing are really unhealthy and mm. not the right way. Mm. And I wanted to get out of here and I left. And then mm. I went to see my dad that was estranged for because of that relationship had broken down. I went to see my dad and wanted to get to know my dad. But mm. that was difficult because of all of the resonance of the... But, uh, to apply that to where we are now, that's really quite significant and beautiful. Mm where we are now and, and, and looking at the society and the structures as the parents mm. as the the thing we thought that knew mm. and now we've got a chance to think hang mm. on a minute maybe we know maybe mm. we can build something mm. and it won't it will never benefit even if you even if the, the, the parents had their issues or, and even if there was self-serving uh, uh, kind of a, a psychology or, or if there was what you know you might term abuse I'm not so my parents are lovely but I'm what I'm talking about now is society mm. Um, it's, it's not going to do you it's not going to save you to just try and destroy the parents okay so our our society our, our structures our institutions the systems that we've set up are massively imperfect but we're not going to gain anything by tearing them down having some kind of violent revolution or whatever we have to as I say become one with them and remember who they are you know who is okay 
You know, I've written an essay just recently for someone's blog, so it's going to be out in a couple of weeks, uh, about the 5th or 6th of February. So anyway, um, <coughs> I, I used this analogy in, in, in the blog. The father of this society is, the, is what became the European empires, which 500 years ago went off to start exploring the Americas, doing more trade with Africa, going to the furthest eastern reaches, and discovered this like beautiful beautiful, lush landscapes, if you like the mother, you understand, that had all this abundance and this beauty. And But this father, the, the, these European empires, the Iberian Peninsula had been at war pretty much constantly for 800 years with the Islamic world mm. in the Med. France and Britain, just as examples, had been at war with each other for 100 years. This was a, a, a violent father and a, an aggressive father who found their way to getting what they wanted through aggression and violence. Mm. So now we're at this stage now whereby we've we've got maybe maybe us the children of that are resent, resentful towards we have resentment for the father, yeah, and we want to just smash him down, you know. But what's what good that going to do? We all have to live in the same house together. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. so how are we going to find a way to work with him, to forgive them, to understand where they're coming from, but also overcome them mm -hmm. and, and don't be controlled by them? Yeah, and lead and, and show show our responsibility, you know, take our responsibility and, and lead. And it always seems like a cliche, but... It, it, they say a revolution is internal, isn't it? You know, you own yourself and, and, and what you're doing with Rise Up, what the book does, Locks, as you've beautifully and articulately put today, you know, painted this picture of your journey, you know, that you started with that wonder of why, what's going on here? Why I didn't ask for this. This is, I'm just here and this thing's happening and I need to know, I want to know. And that journey took you, well, it's a hell of a journey. Get the book, Locks, you know. And as you've said today, Ashley, after Jamaica, the work you're doing now, it's all it's all collated into this... This giving back, trying to, mm. trying to help understand that mm. we are all in this together. Really are, we? The wrong and the right and the binary you spoke of in the beginning is not what it is, and we have you to know, accept that. You know what, mate? <clears throat> those people who are storming the capital or, you know, going along with what, I don't know, Britain first or, you know, it used to be the NF and the BMP when I was a yeah. kid, with far-right politics or whatever, whatever. I, I, I meet guys in prison who've got those kind of views, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can call it white supremacy, we can call it whatever you like or far-right or whatever. And indeed, you know, I know that people, someone decides that they don't like the EU and want to vote for Brexit and then they have all these labels put on them. That's because you're xenophobic, because you're racist, whatever, whatever. I personally... We, we also have to overcome this left-right way of thinking. Usually. And this divisive divide and conquer. And again, it was our fathers, European empires, that <laughs> used that technique all over the world. It was written into the, the, the techniques, you know. Divide mm. and conquer. Don't be divided. If you have views, even if you have views that I find offensive, that doesn't mean that you're my enemy. You are still me. Mm. An aspect of me that I would hopefully be able to help. Um unify and heal mm. it's going to save me no good trying to whack you over the head with my opinions or with a banner why don't you think like me mm. What's, what, what good's it going to do mm. if I can take somebody who's got extreme, extremely different views to me and embrace them and they then go oh actually me and this person we want the same out of this situation we all want the same thing we want a bit of fairness and a bit of justice and to, to live in a place that's safe mm. and to be able to bring our kids up and to be able to eat and be comfortable. And we want that for everyone. We all want the same things. And it's because people aren't getting those basic needs met that they're then attacking each other because it's easy to blame the person next door because you can see them, the immigrant or the black person or the white supremacist you can see them, mm. so it's easy to blame them. Mm. It's difficult to think about those who you never see in the higher echelons of power, let's say, 
yeah. and who you don't have access to. Yeah. It's difficult to contemplate what they're thinking and doing. So they're, but, but hang on, him, he, he, he's, he's been, his, his whole family is silent on the dole. Yeah. His family definitely worked for three generations. It's their fault. It's easy mm. to blame the people. But what's been achieved? Mm. Even if that person is an idiot, even if their views are vile, even if they are a lazy bastard and should get off the house and go to work, so what? That's not the issue with society. Mm. <laughs> That's the, they're not the problem. Yeah, they're that, the symptom of the problem, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe. But it's not on you to tell them. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And if you heal yourself, and who's been saying this the best? This the rev the, the revolution the, is, is the revolution. Who's been spreading the message that the, the real revolution is the revolution of the mind over the decades that we've been growing up, Sam? In my opinion, the people that have been saying that the best and spreading that message in the mainstream throughout the whole world are the people who have created the most oppressed people in this system that the European empires started. Slavery and then colonialism. Let's just start with slavery. Mm. The most oppressed people. Then, out of that system, created the most beautiful, powerful, creative outlet that the world knows which then became the most popular art form in the world, in the Americas, in Europe, France, Spain, Portugal, in Africa, all over the African continent, in Japan. Everybody wants to be a DJ in Japan. Everybody wants to be a rapper all over Africa. They created, let's just simplify it, the blues, to rock and roll, to hip hop which then became all the dance music that we grew up with. Rave yeah. doesn't exist without hip hop. House, yep. garage, yep. all of that stuff doesn't exist without hip hop. Mm -hmm. And now all of that baggy pants spinning on the head, the graffiti art, the DJ, and that way of producing music and making beats, all, all of that stuff came from the most oppressed. Those who had nothing, those who weren't even allowed, to, you, you get whipped or killed mm. for learning how to read and write. Mm. You weren't allowed to love, you'd have your children taken from you. It was legal for you to marry somebody that you fall in love with because they've got a different colour skin. And yet, out of that oppression, out of that darkness came the most powerful, beautiful, mm. powerful mm. light that we have in our, for our generation. You said and it, you, them you said it beautifully it. earlier because you said music manages to be, capture that that subconscious that's underneath everything, the metaphor, yeah. and it speaks to us. And, and, and the, the rappers now, I find, you know, even a lot, a lot of the older guys now that we've been listening to since we were kids, like I've been listening to Killer Priest recently from the Wu-Tang right. Clan, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. his latest album. And you think, wow, these dudes are like older than me now, you know, mm. uh, and they're still going. And, and Speech Arrested Development have got a new album out, for example. Really? Speech is 50 odd. Oh wow. man, it's, the, it's mind blowing. It's beautiful. Uh, don't fight your demons. It's beautiful. I'll oh, check it also out. Also, check out the Killer Priest album. Um, but yeah, you listen to these, I know Speech, AD, has always been talking about, but you know, a lot of these guys who have been you know, pretty hardcore over the years, but they were expressing what they really genuinely felt and the way that they say it on the street in their own vernacular. And now, it's like what a lot of them are saying. It's, they've been reading, man. And they're talking about the stuff we're talking about now. And they're talking about the ancient ways. And they're talking about how we overcome. And it's almost like... It's, <laughs> I'm getting a bit passionate. It's almost like watching the birth of a new religion. Yeah. Agree. And the science, the quantum physics and everything, the old myths, it all comes together. And I've been criticised, and people I know have been, been criticised over the years. You lot, you know, you don't follow a particular way. You just take a little bit of Buddhism. You know, a, 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 a little bit of like some some some, some mythology, you know, mm -hmm. from, the, from the Greeks, or a, a little bit of African history, you know, a mm -hmm. little bit of science, and just put it together in what suits you personally. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> but the beautiful thing is, Ashley, is, is it, I bet I bet if we were to take those things and, and zoom into them on the micro, the substance. Is always the same. It's truth. Of course, it is. it's romance of, of is. being human, of experience, of truth, of, of honesty, of integrity, of responsibility, of that connection. All the religions and the mythological systems, belief systems, and sciences are all heading towards the same reality. And obviously, anybody with a modicum of intelligence 
could give you a very cogent argument for why they are different. We could all point out the differences between uh, Islam and Christianity or Buddhism mm. and Hinduism. Obviously, mm. you can do that. But there's a bit later on in the book here where one dude, Negus, says, you know, some people don't believe that the hero's journey is actually a thing. That's okay. That's cool. You don't, You see the world the way you want to see the world, but here's the thing. There are those of us who are always looking for division. Mm. And there are those of us who are always seeking the unity in all things. You choose your path, man. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, I think that is the way to bring this baby home. <laughs> hey? hey oh, That's man. beautiful. Hey, Ashley, thank you so much for your time. This has uh, been enlightening. It's been energetic. It's been infusing. I was so excited to meet you. I'm, I'm deep in the book and, yeah, I feel like a real... I don't know. When I get in, I'm in. And to have you here and to feel your energy is really nice. Mate, you're, be you're beautiful. What you do is beautiful. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's so... Uh, it benefits me so much to talk to people who not only are reading the book, but really... Um, you know, this is a book about a scallywag doing scallywag stuff and there's there's drugs and there's violence and there's sex and pornography, but there's a speech of people who actually get that the point of it is so much deeper than what it seems mm. to be on the surface. You read in between the lines, you know, mm. you're perceptive enough to get it and then therefore asking me the questions that bring that passion out with me so thank mm. you for that can i just say where that's available to of the course club? yeah that's the way where would people find you we'll point it everything will be linked in at the bottom of this video oh, cool, i will cool. play in fact we'll play the trailer before we go let's put a trailer go on. on find the trailer for locks um the book you should find it on youtube uh I, I, ash sent me this when he's when he when he mentioned you to me and he said you're gonna i think you're gonna love ashley nugent you need to check out his trailer his book is gonna smash it and I watched it and I was like, shit, man, How, who, who made this? And we'll talk so, after. Let, yeah. Let's talk okay. after. Let's watch it and yeah, yeah, let yeah, people at home yeah. see this. Yeah. This is the book, guys. Check it out. Anything that. Oh, the old audio. Who did who who put this together? A guy called Jonathan Hall. Right. He's a filmmaker based right. in Liverpool, and he, uh, yeah, he makes film trailers. Is one of his things. And I gave him the audio from a, a show, a one man state oh, show. Shit, I wanted to talk. We'll talk about that. We'll talk okay. about that, and I'll drop it in because I fucking I've watched some of your stuff, and you you're so adept with that as well. And again, for me, it's the truth. It's your truth coming through. Anything that didn't fit in Sia Bank did not belong. 1993 was the year that Stephen Lawrence got murdered by racists and I became an angry black lad with a chip on his shoulder. I decided that I had to make something happen because it seemed to me that the story of my life had been written in the decisions, opinions and actions of other people. So here I am in Jamaica. Problem was, most of what I knew about slavery came from Bob Marley songs. You answer like this, white boy. You hear you go out and say, he raised a knife. And as I sat there in a Jamaican prison cell, nursing multiple stab wounds, I knew for sure that as long as I survived this thing I'd made happen, this would form the basis of my first book. There is no turning back. Our hero has entered the world of the adventure. The Rasta looked to me like he knew something I didn't know. To give a little something in return may well save your life tonight, little good boy. Everybody wants to be free to develop their own identity in their own time. I mean, I watched that obviously before I've received your package, started reading the book and I've watched it a couple of times since because it encapsulates it. The energy, the art, everything, even the anime for me anyway, the, when I'm, because obviously when we're reading, we're painting the picture, aren't we, in our mind? 
Amazing. Oh, the, the guy that put that together for us, Jonathan Hall. I just sent him a recording of the sh- a, sh- a one-man show version of Locks that I did at the Unity Theatre. And I just sent him the, the footage and he said, send me everything you've got. You've got bits of artwork, you've got quotes, whatever you've got, you've got picture of the book, just send it all to me. And what I, th- what I was expecting was a kind of like a, 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 a montage of bits of the show. That would have done me. Just, like, just put bits together, you know, some funny bits, some dark bits, whatever. And then he came back to me with that. Mm. I, I didn't ask for any animation. Amazing. I wasn't paying him enough mm. to do that. I yeah, just, but he felt, he's felt it, he's connected to it, hasn't he? He just, wants to help carry that message. It's a piece of artwork, so... We're thinking, I'm working with Blackfest, uh, a company that does a lot of thing with stuff with black artists, uh, especially around Liverpool. And I think we're going to work on putting the show out online this year, this summer. Kind of like that, so do the show, but but bits of animation with it, bits of me live, you know, and so it can be a thing that can be for the theatres when the theatres are back, but it can just be a thing that's online as well. Because so, you, you, you are doing, you, there is a one-man show that you have done, as you've just mentioned, yeah. and I've seen clips of it and you... Again, for people who've watched this, will feel you've got you've got that energy. You've got a beautiful way of steering what you're saying, and it comes through. And I love it. And you're using yeah. props, and you've got bits on there, and yeah, silly that's, stuff. And, but that's yeah. a great idea to do that in this in the melee of the, of this stuff. What a way to make so it. So it'll travel. be online. It'll be in the figures. It'll be in the prisons. We're gonna tour the prisons with it and yeah. get free copies out of the book in the prisons. And so I did it in a uh, prison in Nottingham, mm-hmm. actually. Okay. HMP one. Oh, there you go. In front of 80 guys. Right. Lots of Jamaican-y looking guys. Yeah. Yeah. Like looking at me like that. Mm. Oh, that was scary. Because you have to go in in character, you see. I'm not going to say, I, I'm Ash. And yeah. explain who I am and what I do, the way I do with my workshop. It's just like going in character and just start. I'm like, I hope they understand when I'm talking about Jamaican homophobia and racism and, and poverty. I'm, I hope they understand where I'm coming from. And, but, you know, and like, they, they don't know me. These dudes... Mm. But we got there. I was going to say, is, is there a point when you obviously those nerves that you carry and you think, "Fuck shit!" Is it? You know, is there a point when you know you've got them and you and they're there with you? Is there a point there's during d- the different show? points with different parts of the audience? Yeah. We go, okay, they're laughing along with that bit now. They get why I've said that. But there was one dude at the very back, massive dude, black dude, it was makes that next to him, and he was just like. And this was like by towards the end of the show, and I said something like, "So I went to the sun splash. Has anyone been to Kingston?" And this dude went, oh, "I've been to lots of places in Jamaica." Yeah, just that. You yeah. know what I mean? I was like, oh, Mars. It's like Marcellus Wallace, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, was like, oh, I was like, he doesn't like it, he doesn't like it, he doesn't get it. Um, and then what else did he say? I said something about um, the increase says to Eon, uh, some learn the hard way. Mm. And this dude goes, yeah, don't Yeah. I was like, oh, fuck. That's it. I was like, why, why do I do this job? Why, why am I doing this? What's yeah. the, this is, why put myself in this in this position, this danger? And straight after, after the show, I said, so uh, any questions? And this dude was like, uh, so what do you do now? I want to do this in prison and stuff. And he said, and he said, you wrote, wrote a book. Said, yeah, I wrote a book. Yeah, yeah. He said, and then you, you said, you've got an education. Said, yeah, I've been to college, university, blah, blah, blah. He said, so you did that and now you've got a degree. So yeah, I've got a first class degree in English literature. He was, Meaningfully, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, and then, and, then, nice. and then, then he asked the most questions. Wow. And, and there was him and another guy, an old, uh, an older guy who was Rastafarian in a wheelchair. And there was them two that were, that was, when I was doing the show, that I kept thinking, they're not getting it, they're not getting it. And they asked all the questions. And then they couldn't get the, the Rasta guy in the wheelchair out the room. Everyone had gone. And they were saying, you've really got to go. And I said, we just got one more question for him. You <laughs> <laughs> couldn't go, you know. Oh, that's um, so it's beautiful. But I, I just want to make sure before we go, Sam, that mm. I, I, I big up the people that have helped put this together. Of you know, course. My, my, my business partner, Stuart Cody, and everyone at Rise Up for helping to get the book out there. It's published by my com- the company, Rise Up. Um, Jonathan Hall for making the trailer. As I say, Blackfest and all the other organisations, uh, writing on the wall, the Unity Theatre, live theatre in Newcastle. Um, oh, God, I'll miss people out now, won't I? So let's not go too deep into it. Uh, the person, uh, Bryn Davis, who put these beautiful photographs and this package together, who mm-hmm. designed all this, mm-hmm. again, without being paid enough to do so. Mm-hmm. Bryn Davis of Indigenous Arts. Um, the British photog- British. Uh, British uh, something of professional photography. What do they call it? British Institute of Professional Photography. He was their photographer of the year. Wow. Twice, I think, uh, Bryn Davis. And, you know, the you know, these beautiful illustrations that you see throughout yes, this book? Yeah, I meant to bring that. We talked about that before we got started. But, the, I mean, as far as I'm in, I'm in. I've just started to recognise them. And they're lovely, lovely expressions, aren't they? My wife. Wow. Yeah. Powerful, Mrs Nugent. My wife, Poppy. Um, 
on the internet, the Facebook or whatever. She's known as Baxter Bryson or Becky Bryson, BeckyBryson.com. She's an, she's an amazing artist. She builds massive, like, uh, willow structures for festivals and stuff. And But she also, she can make anything. She can draw anything. <laughs> she, I live in, a, in, in, in like, a, an art gallery. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. So, yeah, just to big up all them people who've oh, helped. Oh, that's lovely. Thanks, well, yeah. It sounds like your children are in lovely, honest, creative, open-minded hands and... As you mentioned, as we rebuild the future, yeah, hopefully uh, we can contribute. They've got to do better than us, and and it's our job to help them do that, you know, as best we can. And hopefully, my little bit of basically sitting here and just receiving therapy from, as I said earlier, this podcast for me was just. I mean, I've always been in bands. I clearly want to be heard. I want to. Mm. Ex- I've got this craziness in my mind that I'm trying to unpick and work out. Mm. We're all behind our own skin, aren't we? Mm. Everything else is outside of our skin. But I'm mm. coming around to the idea that no matter how successful, whatever that parameter or barometer is, mm. we've all got the fear. We're all trying to cope. We're all trying to be okay in mm. this chaos. And I get to sit here across from people like you and have your perspective and your energy and your your story arcs and as we build this little community that come here for this mm. to, to to find out what's this what's this life like mm. and what what parallels and correlations can i see and what can i bring back and how can i mm. re-identify maybe and mm. I, that's so important to me and i'm I'm really really privileged to to, to have people like you actually so well, thank you. well thank you and um I'm sorry to keep plugging, but for, for those who don't like Amazon, a lot of people that hate Amazon don't. Yeah. If anyone doesn't like buying from Amazon, um, come it, to your it, website. It, go to Rise Up, indeed. Uh, that that links to Amazon. Go to, come to me on Facebook. Okay, oh, Locks okay. Locks Book Locks Book on Facebook, Amazon, or Twitter, or indeed just go straight to News from Nowhere. It's an independent radical bookshop in Liverpool, and they will deliver by post to anywhere in the world. News from nowhere. You got that? Or if you forget that, just we'll get all that linked in. It'll all be in the bottom of this video. Everything will be there, and um, yeah, we'll 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 do this again in the future. I oh, hope. any time. Love some, as, any as time. the world unravels a bit, and that'll be. It's been a privilege, man. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so Ashley. Much. Bless you, and thank you to the man behind the uh, yeah be, behind the, behind the wall. There. Bless you. He's doing that. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. man. Peace. Peace. Man.